Whatever you're thinking, just think Bruno. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 204th episode of the Inbound Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Last episode, we had on the memory expert, Brad Zupp. If you are telling yourself, oh, I'm terrible with names, I can't remember numbers, oh, if I could only remember phone numbers, and I'm good with faces but not names, then you need to go listen to episode 203. Uh, Brad gives some great and easy to implement tips and strategies, little tactics for remembering faces, names, and numbers. But certainly names. Uh, that is the single most important thing you need to master when it comes to sales, especially if you're out networking regularly, if you're going to trade shows, chamber of commerce functions, things like that. Man, if you can remember somebody's name and use it, they will think you are a miracle worker and they will be attracted to you. Uh, you will increase the bonding, the empathy, the trust, the rapport that I talk about in my better prospecting system, and you will make more sales. So go check out Brad's up. If you haven't listened to that, you can go to the saleswhisper.com forward slash session two zero three. Next week we have uh, Laura Bush. She is going to help you with branding, right? Should I build a brand? Should I focus on building a brand? Am I a brand? How do I monetize a brand? Uh, but speaking of trade show, she gets into how to rock a trade show, uh, how to make money at those types of events. And you will want to tune in for the next episode. Today we have Louis Bruno. I won't steal any of his thunder, but young individual that has created a thriving business doing eight figures in HVAC in Florida. And his story is pretty remarkable. Uh, but what he did is totally reproducible for any services business. Okay. So you're going to want to take a lot of notes. Uh, we had a great conversation. He was a referral, um, from a friend of mine that's helped me with uh, my own social media and marketing. So you're in for a great treat. Now, while you are listening, uh, I recommend you head on over to the saleswhisperer.com forward slash session two zero four, uh, to get the notes and the links. But when you're on any of these episodes and any of the blogs, look over on the right-hand side and opt in for my new daily email tips. Uh, that will give you the insight daily in bite-sized little nuggets, bite-sized morsels, uh, where I talk about how to generate inbound sales. Uh, it's a precursor, uh, a prelude, a little sneak peek uh, in what I offer in the Inbound Sellers Club. So be sure to check that out. You can opt out at any time, uh, but this is a no fluff, easy to consume, not a bunch of images and graphics cluttering up your phone or your desktop. It's just stories and tactics and strategies you can use to create the ultimate in reproducible, scalable business, and that's by creating inbound sales. So like I said, head on over to any of the blogs, uh, any of the podcast episodes, and the opt-in is on the right-hand side. So now let's bring on Mr. Bruno. Louis Bruno, just think Bruno, all the way from Naples, Florida. Welcome to the sales podcast. How the heck are you? Doing well, Wes. Thanks for having me, man. I uh, read a lot about you. We're friends on social media now, and, and, I, and I like your style, so I'm happy to be here. Hey, you know, we got a mutual friend, Batya, and, uh, you know, I do whatever she tells me to do, all right? That's just 21 years of marriage I learned. You meet a smart woman, just do what she says to do, and your life gets a lot easier, right? Yeah, definitely. I'm uh, two years into it, so i uh, got a two-year-old now, too. Oh, very nice. So I learned the hard way, let's say that. I have a 19-year-old all the way down to a two-year-old, so um, I know where you're coming from, and I know where you're going, so uh, get ready. <laughs> So, man, you're out there in Naples, and you own your own heating, air conditioning, and now plumbing, which is why it's just Think Bruno, right? But did I read that right? You're up to 150 employees? Yeah, we peaked um, somewhere around probably 160 or 170 before we had some uh, software efficiency upgrades. And, uh, and, and I really stopped once we crossed like 100 I really stopped counting the number of employees because it ultimately didn't matter. You know, our new hire orientation was probably three to seven new people each week for probably nine months. Good grief. And so it was a lot of fun. You know, we made a lot of mistakes. We had to learn the hard way on how to hire. 
Um, and uh, and so the employees really, they're the ones that, you know, help us scale. So cliche, like you read it in, you know, the everything store or you read it in Delivering Happiness from Tony Shea. But it, until you physically feel what it's like to have people grow your business, it just sounds like a cliche. Right. And so it's been it's been a lot of fun with that. And and like I said, you know, we learned the hard way. We 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 let's just say when I was in charge of hiring for the first hundred people, none of my interview questions were behavioral. <laughs> you know, ultimately we were growing so fast you just needed a heartbeat and uh, to be able to communicate. So it was interesting once we started hiring and redirecting off of core values, what happened to the organization. All right. So what did happen? Well, um, you know, it becomes a, a super long story, basically starting off with the story of Bruno. You know, I started Bruno out of my house 2013. I started in the air conditioning business at 17 years old. And so I started right out of high school for a small family-owned company carrying the owner's tools around. And as I carried his tools, I, I was super shy in high school. I was afraid of the ladies. You know, I, uh, I, I didn't really make great eye contact. I basically was just in school for sports. <clears throat> and so um, what I noticed helping repair air conditioners in Florida to the elderly or people with asthma or breathing conditions was there's a desperate need for it, man. And, and 17 years old, it was, I was impressed on pretty powerfully, you know, having somebody have an 85 or a 90 degree house coming in and fixing it for, you know, 200 bucks or 400 bucks and then being the most gratifying experience of that person's life, it seemed like at the moment. And so it, it had a lot of power, um, power over me and I kind of fell in love with the business. And so I ran his business for six years and at 20, Two, I started writing my business plan to start Bruno Air. Started it when I was twenty-three. So you were, so you were working for somebody else. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and then, so for six years, and then, so twenty thirteen, you said it was when you started Bruno Air. Yeah, I got it. It was funny. I uh, had a girlfriend at the time. She was. I started dating when I was twenty-one. <clears throat> so we were together like three years, two years, two and a half years, and uh, I, I knew that I was going to be starting Bruno Air as of. You know, July of 2012, so I started business planning. I formed an informal board of advisors to help me write the business plan and tell me give some give me some advice. September 20th, 2012, I turned in my notice. I was a 60-day notice I gave to the company. I left December 1st, the week after Thanksgiving. Got engaged December 5th and uh, incorporated and got everything rolling probably the middle of December, January 1st, 2013, we opened up. So 60-day notice, that's pretty nice. Yeah, you know, uh, I had to uh, see, see, it's funny because I didn't know it at the time. Again, you know, it's being, an, what not, being an entrepreneur meant to me in 2013 is totally different to, than it means today. I didn't know what it meant, right? To me, I thought I was just starting a business. It was, I was a 23-year-old kid, me against the world. But um, when I started with them in 2006, I, uh, I, uh, I started carrying the tools. And then by the end of 2006, I was basically the lead service tech training the other guys. And they had been in business for 10 years at that point. They started in 96, but they were only doing about 400 grand in revenue. They didn't advertise at all. And so from 96, 2006, they had built their company to 400 grand in revenue. And from 2006 to when I left in 2012, I mean, I, I won't necessarily take the credit for it, but we built it from 400,000 a year to two and a half million. And so uh, rapid expansion. And, and so they basically built the company around me. And, you know, I'm a man of my word. And, and it wasn't anything personal for the previous two years. I tried buying 10% of the company, but the owner was a 35 year old guy and, you know, he didn't want to sell it. He was building it for his kids. So I said, hey, man, no hard feelings, but, you know, I'll give you enough notice you can to replace me, uh, but i got to do my own thing. Right. Well, that's cool. So did y'all end on good terms? Uh, naturally, he's disappointed. Nice. Uh, and then the first year, it was ugly. My first year in Bruno and in, in starting Bruno was ugly because, you know, we... I wrote a business plan to do four hundred thousand dollars in revenue for year one, and we did two point eight million or something. So um, 
you know, I took a lot of customers from a lot of people. You know, these, these aren't people that wake up one day and they become new air conditioning clients. They were most likely using somebody else. So naturally, across that 600% of your goal, naturally, I, you know, some of his customers called me. And so he took it very personal, you know, that I didn't say, hey, I'm, I'm not going to service you. Um, you know, I mean, I said, hey, they didn't, they didn't necessarily call me direct. They might have called my ad or they might have called, uh, I had a company phone with them. They might have called, you know, they might have been unhappy with their service or forgot they had their service or whatever it is. They ended up calling our advertisement and using us. So, you know, he took it personal. But after that, with the, we continued to rapidly expand. He kind of saw that we were going a different direction. And, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's on as good as terms as possible. Right. So you said your goal was to do 400K and you did two and a half million? Yeah, year one. Dude, why are you so bad at forecasting? I don't, I don't know if I should be talking to you. <laughs> Terrible, man. <laughs> Terrible. Um, it kind of it kind of just exploded. You know, when I was with them, we didn't advertise. We grew completely word of mouth. So what I learned best was how to build a business without an advertising budget, how to build a business off of referral, what type of service to provide. I mean, they were a small family-owned company, and they provided phenomenal service. And so I learned really it, at the true heart of it, how to get a referral, how to ask for a referral, how to close on that referral, and what property and what value networks, not necessarily networking, but networks had. And so I knew I knew what was important to the property managers of the associations because that's how we had grown their business. And so I just took that same model and took it into Bruno and, and, and started that and, and really and really hammered it, man. You know, it, it's hustle, hustle somewhere along the lines got like this bad, this bad meaning. And, and I don't really know why. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a hustler and, and I hustle it out. So how do you ask for referrals and close referrals? Well, you can't be assumptive or I'm sorry, you can't be um, passive with it, right? You got to assume the referral. You got to say at the end of at the end of every experience, if you flat out ask, "Can you send referrals our way?" You know who's not going to say yes. You have to assume the referral. So you have to say, "Hey, who do you think? Who do you know that could benefit from the same service you had?" It's very difficult for them to say then no or even yes. You know when you say who versus will you get us some referrals versus will you send us some referrals your way. For somebody to say yes, when I ask them, who do you know that can benefit from our service as well, then uh, then it's very awkward. You know, people want to be agreeable. People want to 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 be comfortable. People don't want humans as, as, as a species. They don't want to deal with an uncomfortable situation. So if I say, hey, Wes, who do you know that will benefit from the same type of service you did today? And you say yes, well, then you realize it sounded awkward. And I say, no, who do you know would benefit? And we're like, oh, well, uh, you know, probably my cousin Jack or, you know, my neighbor Ron or the president of the association. Okay, fantastic. What's the best way to reach him? And then, you know, again, they can't say no or yes to that. And you know, then they get me the contact info or an email address and you just stay on it from there. Yeah, I usually ask for three referrals too. I'll usually say, hey, who's three of your family members or friends or your neighbors that would benefit from the same service? And so you get the numbers out of them and you just hammer it down. So, like, if you came to my house right now, I mean, we've got this crazy heat wave. It's 111 here in Murrieta, California, which is, you know, we have a lot of 100 degree days, but not 111, and certainly not in early June or mid June. Uh, so, I mean, if you came to me, I don't know who I would give you. Uh, so do you have ways to help kind of jar their memory, get the creative juices flowing? Yeah. You know, we, we usually say, so are you involved with the board or who's the president or, um, or fam? I mean, really families are real key too, but of course there's occasions where three or four or five questions in, you, you don't get an answer and it, then it becomes awkward and, or then you're pushy. So you've got to, you know, do like leave behind stuff. But usually after two or three questions, somebody will come to mind. You just ask the same question multiple different ways. So what is your leave behind, and do, do people use it? Yeah, we actually, I mentioned earlier, some software upgrades and efficiencies that we've gained. We've got this phenomenal tracking system that every single one of our marketing materials gets printed a, um, obviously, a different phone number, which, which isn't unheard of. 
But what's cool about our software system is it tracks that phone call all the way through the scheduling process. So I'm able to tell what leave behinds and, and everything gets assigned to a phone number and what types of marketing material physically work. And it's, uh, and it's interesting that, you know, that, that magnets will work better than business cards or, or business cards will work differently than, 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 than like a PDF glossy sheet or like a double-sided glossy PDF sheet will generate more revenue than magnets. And so, and so we're talking large scale. I mean, today we're able to do, this isn't how I started the business. Um, today we're able to do it because we're in two or 300 houses a day. So we're, we're asking if, if every one of my guys are trained, we're in two or 300 houses and every single one of my guys are trained to get three referrals, then that's a potential of 900 referrals. Now, even if we get 1% of that, we're getting nine. Right. So you know, that's a lot when that's a, nine referrals in one day at a 1% uh, gain rate is, 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 is okay. Every average to every customer interaction to us is worth 12 to 1500 bucks. So if we get out of those nine, we schedule half of them, you know, that's a $7,000 increase in revenue. Right. So, but, but when I started the business, it was, it was a lot of canvassing, right? So I didn't know, I wanted to know, I wasn't sure. One of the best things that, and even today, that entrepreneurs can have is the mindset that you don't know what you know until you know it. And so when you kind of assume that you don't have the answers and you just question a lot. One of the first things I did is I wanted. I lived in a family neighborhood. I wanted to know how my neighbors would call a home service company, air conditioning at the time. Again, my experience wasn't with advertising. We had a. I had worked for a small family-owned company. I grew completely organic. So I went up and down, and I had 500 or 600 homes in my neighborhood. I went up and down every street, whoever was home, and I started a list. And 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 I found two or three sources that that kind of like stood out awkward, like. Like the neighborhood had a uh, had a referral site, which were pretty pretty uncommon at the time because 2013, um, even though it was three years ago, I would say that you know the 50 year old, 60 year old plus is really my market. The significant percentage still wasn't using Google, and so when for the for the neighborhoods to have individual sites about who people used and to get recommendations and referrals through that network, it was powerful. And by the time I had a one or a two year head start on my competition by the time that it became kind of um, kind of common sense for, for those networks to be there. So how, how do you train a blue collar technician to ask for referrals? Because I've seen that as a struggle in most companies. That's, that's actually a, a great question. Um, and, and, and that's why I get paid the big bucks, baby. And, and naturally, through the <laughs> progression of our story, it, it, it kind of gets answered. So, so, so I started right doors open January 1st, 2013. And I went from, I got hired June of 2006. I went from having zero experience at 17 years old, thinking I was shy. Once I got my job as a helper, figuring out I actually liked people and I could communicate about their problems. From June through September of 2012, I was basically a certified technician. And whereas majority of the industry sends you to school for two years, I learned completely hands-on in the field through, uh, through asking a lot of questions, but through a very informal yet formal training procedure with the owner of the company, right? I mean, I was with a guy that had been in the business since he was 13, so 20 plus years, 22 years. And so, uh, and so he trained me directly hands on. So I knew that I could be a completely certified technician in a three month period. So I figured, Hey, you know what? I know Eric, I have six years experience in this. I knew that the blue collar guys were the most set in their ways. You know, they, especially when they've been doing it five, 10, 15, 20 years, they were least likely to change. They had the most resistance to change, but I knew that I with a customer, didn't know it at the time, but with a customer service approach, I could get trained or train somebody in a 90-day period. I started refining that, okay, how can I get them trained faster? So my first 25 employees, none of them were from the AC business. And they were completely from customer service, fine dining, Ritz-Carlton, 
you know, wine loft, the restaurants, because those businesses had significant, and, and I knew with the customer service approach, we could grow and scale. Um, we could, we could, we could, we could have, we could close more deals. We can get more referrals. We can, we can communicate better. But I knew that if I refined that process, even from 90 days to 60 days or to 45 days, then I can turn technicians out of a training program super fast to maintain and service air conditioners. Because at the time we weren't a replacement company. Until we got to 30 employees or so, I had to start hiring installers. So uh, we refined it to a 35 day program. So in 35 days, we took somebody from completely outside the business and turned them into a maintenance and a service tech on residential air conditioners. And we got phenomenal positive feedback. I had my highest referral rate, five and a half guys, five and a half referrals per customer over a 12 month period from that customer service approach. So how in the heck can somebody, how'd you take a two year process and turn it into 35 days? Well, two years, I would say that Schools can do it faster too, but no matter how many times you read something in a book, you still don't know what it looks like in the field. And so when you're teaching a process versus an industry, it becomes repeatable and reproducible. So I got really, really good at developing process and uh, developing procedures. So I took uh, the average air conditioning maintenance in the country is probably 15 points. But I said, why not flip those numbers and make it 51 points and really add a significant value that, that nobody else is doing? And, and on top of that, it's a part of the business model that if I'm checking 51 things and everybody else is only checking 15 things, that leaves me to find potentially 36 more things with problems. So what does that mean? You're talking about you, you actually inspect 51 things in a home or on a unit? Yeah, on an air, back in 2013, on an air conditioning system. Okay. Now it's like 89 points for the house, including plumbing and electric. <clears throat> but um, but but if everybody else like so, let's say, you know, John from down the road calls us out for maintenance, and he's been having his unit maintained once or twice a year for the last six years. But those guys, the industry standard is 15 a 15 point maintenance check or an 18 point maintenance check, or even a 20 point maintenance check. And I come out and I check those 20 things. Well, the reality is those 20 things are proper are probably well maintained. But the manufa- in the manufacturer's book, it says that there's 101 components to an air conditioning system. So why are the other 81 not getting checked? I don't know. Um, it's not for me to decide. Do the other 81 points break? Of course, they're, they're parts, they're components. They have electrical connections. They have fittings. They have wire nuts. They have things that loosen up and cause more resistance. And, and so I, I can't answer the question as to why nobody else did it. But I found out very early that Hey, if I check these extra 31 points, these are going to be 31 parts and pieces that nobody has ever checked before. And so most likely um, they wouldn't have been preventively repaired or replaced. And I happen to think people want to be like me. Like if somebody comes out to my home, I don't want it my, before I was in plumbing, I don't want my, my, uh, I have, I live on a well. I have some, I have a well, I live on some land. I don't want my well pump to go out at midnight, right? I don't want my, me to be in the shower, my, my son or my wife or whatever it is, and then me have to wait till somebody comes out. I would want it preventively repaired. So I, I happen to think that most people would like that, at least our market. And so when I'm checking 31 points that nobody's ever checked before, there's obviously opportunity for, for, for things to be wrong and for us to fix things before they break. But also you're adding a level of expertise and value and professionalism that they're not getting from somebody else when the stand, they're getting more for the same amount of money. And, uh, and, and so back to the process, when I say I can train somebody on checking 50 components, they don't necessarily need to know what down the line they serve or how they will break or, you know, that's for, that's for me to have a more skilled guy, right? Let's say, let's say you have a thousand customers in one year, maybe 50 of their units are going to break. So I don't need 1000 guys for that, I need you know two or three specialized technicians to service 50 broken units. When I can have 10 or 12 or 15 that are doing the maintenance on a thousand units, so I ended up taking their skill sets and scaling out the uh, the the technical expertise and having less technical experts and having more customer service oriented people. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you because how, how can you take somebody that was a waiter and 35 days later he knows 81 points to check and can tell if something's wrong with all 81 points? Hey man, they were they were fine dining servers and uh, 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 
And uh, hey, this is the no spin zone. O'Reilly and I both own that name. No spin, baby. No spin zone. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, and and so it's either good or bad, right? It, Here's the beauty. It's not rocket science, and it's actually mind-blowing to me. If there's any home service contractors out there listening, there's 81 points on the manufacturer sticker. <laughs> right on the sticker, it gives you the window that the parts are supposed to read between. I'm not making it up. It's not in a book. It's in the book, too. It's, it's not on a website. It's not uncovered in some 1,000-page manual. Literally, on the machine that you're about to take the panel off of, there's a manufacturer sticker with a bunch of numbers and ratings and readings on there. And one meter, well, shoot, three meters check all of them, but one meter checks 25 of the components. And it tells you what the resistance should be, what the amp should be, what the microfarad should be, or whatever the little measurements on that meter are. And so you put them, you literally put one on a positive side, one on a negative side, polarity, and, and the meter meter tells you and, and when it's outside the manufacturer's window and it's bad it becomes a very easy explanation hey mr johnson this is the manufacturer's window it's written directly on your unit it's supposed to be 15 it's acceptable at 13 yours is 11 what do you want to do well what's going to happen well technically the parts are already bad well it doesn't sound like i have a choice lewis no mr johnson it's either going to be replaced now or it's going to break in the middle of the night what do you want to do well let's just do it now so so you don't you don't need a technical expert. You're doing one procedure, which is using the meter on you know 25 plus components for one meter, and it ends up being a reproducible process when you scale it out from a procedural way. All right, I'm getting the AC repair. We're ending this conversation. We got to go. <laughs> That's awesome. So then you so you're growing, and you but you consciously. And purposely, you said your first 25 hires were outside of the industry. I mean, so how did you know you could scale and support customers? I mean, because it sounded like you were the only true technician, right, out of 26 people. So we were seeing an average of probably, you know, three people a day, three or four people a day per person. Okay. And again, they were doing the maintenance, you know, they were doing the 50 point checks. So at that point is when people's units started breaking. We were about three months in. So, so basically January, we did like 71,000 in sales. Um, February, we did 91. March, we did 113. And then April is the month that really, uh, towards the end of March, it started blowing up. April, we did 313,000 in sales. And for every month, the rest of the year, we would do over 300,000. And so, uh, and so, uh, when 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 the bubble kind of burst, it was like, okay, now we need some technical experts. <clears throat> and you know, the air conditioning trades, the blue collar trades. I don't want to say it was necessarily easy to hire guys, but two dollars an hour, three dollars an hour more, and and selling my story. Hey, look, I was in your shoes, you know. 12, 12 months ago, eight months ago, nine months ago. But here you were able to get in at the ground level and really be one of the people I count on. And so I was able to sell the story, give them a bump in pay, and, and we had the work. So it, it became a I had my I had my choice. I was able to cherry pick the guys that I wanted that were customer service oriented that fit our again, I didn't have core values at the time. I didn't know what they were. I had a board in the office. We started out of my house. Didn't have an office until April. I had a board in my office that had, uh, you know, like like idealistic, like a code of ethics. Um, be innovative and and be accountable and and uh, and I don't even remember now. I still have it up in my home as a as a for kind of nostalgia. But um, but I kind of led through vibration, right? I didn't know what managing people was like. I had never really had a job managing people. I managed three or four techs at my previous company, and so I led through vibrations and and, and energy, and uh, and and they knew that I would be the first guy through the wall. So I didn't have that kind of that that code that that core values. What core values really become today, is, as I've learned, is they basically become like bumpers on a bowling alley. Uh, bowling lane and it helps people make decisions without asking you so it helps you scale out and and as long as they make those decisions within those bumpers then hey even when they make a mistake they're not going to screw up that bad you know it's something that's going to be fixable because the decisions were made within your core values so um i could i could go into that all day 
I think one of your core values was uh, was have a good memory, but that might have been farther down on the list. Maybe you didn't read that one. <laughs> ah. uh, okay, so you're hiring all these people, and but still, I mean, like my son, he's 18, he's he's looking for a job. He's got a fast food job, but he wants something to pay his tips. And, you know, there's some good jobs you can get, uh, waiting tables at some better restaurants, and make some good money. So, I mean, how, how do you get somebody from, hey, you can work in this nice restaurant and air conditioning. Uh, to, I mean, you're in Florida. It's friggin' hot. I mean, it's humid, and you know, it's like, hey, you're gonna run around, maybe climb in some at, in some attics, you know, maybe get stung by some wasps, you know, maybe see a cotton mouth or two, uh, <laughs> you know, a couple couple tarantulas out there in Arizona out west. Yeah, Not and, tarantulas, uh, and scorpions. Yeah, and and some crazy people with their boa constrictors. They let them go out for a walk, and they forget to come back. Dude, like three weeks ago. No kidding. Somebody, there was a 12-foot python running around our church. Like, the priest was like, uh, no kidding, everybody. Don't let your kids walk around the back of the church because there's a 12-foot python that has been seen in the area. <laughs> like, what? Gosh. So so now your guys get to go check the AC unit when there's a 12-foot python running around. I mean, that, it, that can't be an easy sale. But you make it sound like it was kind of easy. Well, I think that it becomes a story of, Having you know fifty year olds and forty year olds, and, and like you hit it on the head, serving isn't a bad job. You know, serving is actually a good job, and you can make you know quite a bit of money. But it's not necessarily the easiest job to build a family and a life around. And you know, the same money you're making at, as a twenty five year old, you know, you see the fifty year old servers doing the same thing. And so, unless you know, if 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 you if you don't plan on being a manager or getting into like a nine to five thing, then then you're going to miss things in your kid's life. And, and it became an easy sale saying, hey, look, we're, this is where we're going. We're already, our year one goal was 400000 We are uh, crossed that through the first week of April. And my story, you know, I had a lot of, my first three hires were, were friends. You know, I had a lot of friends that saw, you know, I had friends that go to college and Four years out of, after their college degree, they would come out, get an accounting job for, you know, 36 or 40 grand a year, whatever, with a bachelor's degree or wherever they would go. And my, you know, frankly, my second year in the business, I made a lot of money. I made, you know, over double that. And, and so I was living a different lifestyle than like an adult. You know, I was an 18 year old kid making adult money, living a lifestyle that they were still in college. And so I was able to sell that story to the, my first couple friends. And then as, as, as we all were selling it, then, um, you know, the, the, the servers that, again, they didn't want to be servers the rest of their life. They wanted family. They wanted kids. They, they wanted in another level. It became, hey, let's, let's take a nine-to-five type job Very cool. with, with that opportunity. So I take it there's some profit sharing or some type of ownership you give your people? No. Um, we're coming in to talk about it this year. Okay. We've been talking about it for like 12 months, but we haven't um, – it's been our number one problem so far has been financial reporting, uh, not to the degree of, of, of out of business or not, but able to really tell what those numbers should look like from a profit sharing perspective and, and, and whether it should be what, what, what's most tax advantageous. Should it be formal profit sharing? Should it be 401k to match? And so that's the next step that you know, we really need a competent financial person to help us point the right direction because that's that's a big you don't want to make the wrong move there you know that's a big decision and i want everybody to be incentivized like they are owners so you had mentioned you kind of you were hiring by feel or whatnot but now are you using assessments i mean what are you doing to to put some processes around your hiring to make sure you get good people so i would say when i was in charge of hiring up until about 100 employees this is july so so <laughs> it goes back into the story. So year one, right, four hundred thousand dollar goal. We end up with two and a half or two point seven or whatever it was. And then year two is two thousand fourteen. So I rewrite the business plan, and I rewrite the business plan for five million as a goal, and uh, we were going to double in size, and we end up with somewhere between nine and ten or ten point one or something. So we had another exponential growth year, and we end two thousand fourteen with like ninety six employees. And so as we cross 100 people, you know, Richard Branson actually talks about this. Basically, every time that he, his, one of his companies had 100 people, he basically starts over. 
And I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't fortunate enough to read the article until like I had 160 people. <laughs> but, um, but at 100 people, I'm like, man, I can't hold this thing together all by myself. And like, I've got my, my highest managers in the company are the first three people I hired. Literally December 1st, I hired two guys in the same meeting. And, uh, and a couple weeks later, I hired an office manager who are still with the company. And, and coming into 2015, they were the highest rated people. But I felt like, Something was wrong. Like at this point, we're tracking like 18 million in revenue, insane. Um, and I'm basically going department to department, putting out fires, firefighting all day. And it felt like it felt like that wasn't the way business should look. And it felt like that wasn't today. Now I know that hey man, that's just business. <laughs> that's just dealing with people uh, to a degree. But um, but I felt like I was doing something wrong. So I was on this quest to find out what was going on, and I kind of stumbled into. A lot of a lot of leadership programs and 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 I had again that board of informal advisors. I had an advisor that for big corporate America, he his specialty was Six Sigma, lean operating procedures. And so I'm talking to him, and he goes, "Well, you know, if you feel like you're going department to department, what you got to do is you got to lay these departments out into swim lanes, and then time out the swim lanes and see how much time you're spending in each swim lane. And as you break down the swim lane." You'll break it down into, you know, points of points of basically process points, and so I line out my my seven or eight swim lanes: customer service, sales, installation, maintenance. And I realize as I time this out, the physical actions that I'm a part of helping, there's 29 hours in one day, that worth of times that I'm putting in. And I, I mean, I was working 18, 19 hours. You know, I was pulling my hair out. And so as I do this, I, was, well, no, I, I go back to him and I say, hey, man, there's like 29 hours here. And he said, well, there's your problem. You need, you need to delegate. You need you know, an operations manager. You, know, you need to segregate the specialties and the people that have skills in those roles. And so I, I kind of ended up down this path looking for corporate structure, looking for process development. And, uh, and, and what I stumbled into was core values and processes and uh, core focus and niche and per, per, purpose and mission, and I've done a lot of business things, but but I didn't. I still needed that that operations manager. I still needed that person that was a champion and a professional at developing people. And so uh, once I I was about six meetings deep with with this individual. His name was John, my my advisor about Six Sigma and lean operating procedures and, and waste. And what the you know the elements of waste are. I was about six meetings deep, and I'm like, man, this is. He helps me start gathering applications. He traveled the country. He he worked for. A, he was on a team called Lighthouse for Hertz. And what Lighthouse would do is they would travel the country, and they would go to the underperforming Hertz airport locations, and they would they would have ten or twelve KPI points, and whether overtime was up or profits were down or whatever it is, the underperforming under the average, they would go. And they would spend two weeks there and they would peel back why the airport location was failing or why the overtime was high. And, and so got really good at dissecting the problems, breaking them down into an understandable way, developing the people at the location to see what waste looks like, to see why they weren't profitable, to see why, you know, L.A. was doing better than New York City or vice versa. L.A. is actually pretty bad. But why, why Boston was doing better or whatnot. And so um, six meetings in, I'm asking him about what his week was like. And I'm like, man, this is the guy that, that I need to hire. This is the guy that's total pro at developing people. And so I made, I put my big boy pants on in the next four to six meetings. I spent with him. I met with him 10 or 12 times. I was softly recruiting him. And, uh, and after the sixth after the twelfth meeting, the sixth after I was recruiting him, I ended up making him a job offer, and he took it like two months later, and uh, it took me wooing him for another six weeks probably, and uh, he came on as my COO, and he helped me put a lot of these systems. Well, he didn't help me. He he put a lot of these systems together from a development standpoint. You know, electronic coaching tools and and what accountability really looked like. You know, that's if I could make one recommendation to entrepreneurs is to me is accountability was a very awkward, uncomfortable thing. You know, I didn't, I, 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 I couldn't, to me, it was either, you either work here or I fired you at that point. Like I let it get to that point. Whereas accountability and redirection is, is a very coachable, is a, is a very process, again, 
oriented thing where people want to do a good job. They just need the right direction or redirection to get there. And so he developed a lot of these traits. And, and when we turned the lights of accountability on, you know, July of 2015, about a month or two after he had started building some of these systems, we went from 150 employees to like 95 um, in the middle of the summer because uh, what we found is the people that, that, that ended up sticking around that didn't, that essentially made the cut per se from an accountability standpoint, they ended up doing the same amount of work that the 150 was doing. And then so we rebuilt the culture back up to, before the software integrations recently, back up to 150, 160, 170, around people that were behaviorally hired, people that fit our core values, people that wanted to do a good job, wanted to provide an next level customer experience. And, and so it helped, us, it helped us scale from, you know, how to manage and develop people. So what are some of the, the things you put in place? I mean, are you doing like Myers-Briggs or DISC assessments, things like that to hire to your, to your culture? John had about, I don't know, he's, he's a super analytical guy, not salesman oriented at all. He says he's had about 15,000 interviews, right? He got hired with Hertz in 1987. So I, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but this guy's like a total pro. We would we would get in just behavioral questions. We just recently started doing personality assessments, um, like disc profiles. We had done a we had a I think it was ASC or ADC. There was a there was a personality profiling um, questionnaire that we used. It was nineteen bucks per per application or whatever. And so it would help us point in the right direction uh, from a, it would fit you into four quadrants of personality. But, um, but John was, he's just a super read man. He would, as I would see him, I would be like, I'm super high on this guy. I really want to hire him. And he's like, no, nah, I don't even think he's going to show up for interview too. And the guy wouldn't show up for interview too. And so John just, he had that read and, and, and maybe it was a combination of the profiling and what he got. But John basically hired, you know, re- rebuilt the culture and, and hired around it. But you know, we had we had some cues through the personality profiling. But but we but he he's just like a professional interviewer. He's super behavioral questions, like instead of "Are you a hard worker?" Tell me three times about where you feel like your 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 ethics were put to a test, or tell me three times about where you stepped up for the team, or tell me you know an instance of where your where your where your ethics were tested, or Tell me about a time when you got in a fight with your boss. And, and you know, people, <laughs> the people that couldn't answer the questions, you know, in his, in his perspective, then, then, or they, or they, you could tell they were making up a story or they stumbled over their words or they weren't direct or they weren't clear. You end up getting a lot of insight about people when you ask behavioral related questions versus, hey, tell me, you know, tell me if you're hardworking or stuff that I used to do. I used to say, Hey, look, I take people at my, one of my famous lines is, hey, look, I take people at face value. You know, can I count on you on the weekends? They're like, yeah, I mean, they're trying to get a job, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, of course you can count on me on the weekends. But John's version of that question would be, hey, so tell me about a time where your manager got stuck in a bind and you had to come in and help out on a Saturday. And, uh, and you know, if they stumbled over their words or there was never a time, then, you know, 75% of the time they probably wouldn't be the best hire. It reminds me of uh, Eddie Murphy's Delirious. Why'd you eat the ice cream off the floor? Mama! You may, be, you may be too young. You have to go check that out, though. Eddie Murphy was the man back in the day. Um, Got to ask the hard questions. Uh, and that, that's what I do like about this. So, you know, everyone that's listening, uh, without us getting into the actual tests or whatever, uh, I mean, it sounds like if I could boil this down is you have very tough processes. You put people through a very stringent hiring and screening process and you expect them to rise up to your level of expectation instead of kind of stepping down and begging them to join you as I see a lot of companies often do and it gets them into trouble right yeah I mean um, you know that's a big reason why we went from 150 to 95 you know we had I had, I'd be I had built this culture of unfortunately significant entitlement and it was this it was this entirely different mindset versus we're all in this together and we're all here for the customer. It became this organization culture of, hey, can you work Saturday? Well, what are you going to do for me? I'm not coming in for less than a weekend bonus. I'm not coming in for less than this. Or, And so 
and I didn't know it at the time. It just kind of got away from me. And, um, and it, I was shocked that 95 people did the work of 150 for like a month until we built the culture back up. That's amazing. <laughs> so, I mean, were you actively firing people or were you just letting them know there's a new sheriff in town? They kind of left on their own or a little bit of both? No, um, you know, it was funny at that point. I, like I said, it was either you have a job here or I basically sat down with you and said, hey, we got to part ways. So when people started getting, you know, verbal warnings and then written warnings or, you know, the first thing, the first thing I learned from John, hey, Robert, the first thing that I learned from John was I thought, you know, verbal warning. I was like, oh, man, they're going to they're gonna, gonna call this guy in and verbally warn him. You know, first thing that you got to do is is people pe- – the job doesn't get done or the process doesn't get followed for one of three reasons. Either the person didn't have the training or they didn't have the tools or it became behavioral. So first thing you do is, hey, so this happened. This customer called in with this complaint or this happened on this job. We had this call back. Or whatever it is, or this this person's food came out wrong. If you go into a different industry, or or you know this person's car was dirty, as John would say, and hurts. So the first thing you would do is you go, okay, who is responsible for this? Well, you know John was responsible for this. Okay, John, let's have a talk. So this process wasn't followed. So did you not understand? Was it not clear enough? No, no, look, you know, nobody's ever explained it to me. Good. Okay, so you got it. You understand it. Yeah, great. So it won't happen again. Nope, fantastic. All right, let's move on. Well, then the next time that John makes that same mistake, you grab John, you say, hey, John, look, the same mistake happened. What happened this time? Oh, no, I I had the training, but then, you know, I didn't have the right tools. Okay, so you didn't have the right tools? Are those company provided tools or are those tools that you provide? No, no, they're they're my tools. They just broke. Okay, so, John, you know, we can't do the job right without the right tools. So what are we going to do? I'm going to go out and buy the tools. Okay, so then John makes the mistake the third time. Now he's got the training. Now he says that he has the tools. And so you say, so you got the training and your tools worked, right? So what happened? Oh, I just, I just got lazy, man. Well, well, when it's behavioral is when accountability comes in. And so it's kind of like, you know, not the three strike rule, but then accountability starts. And then so if you, you either redirect the, the behavior, you change the behavior from accountability, or ultimately that person doesn't care enough to be there. And so you got to part ways, you know, after once or twice. Maybe he says, no, no, look, I really want to do a good job. I'll never be lazy again. Well, fantastic, John. That's the attitude we want. So, uh, so the next time it can count on you, so then the next time a mistake happens, he kind of knows what's coming. You know, he's kind of like shit, you know. You know, if for him to do it again, he just doesn't fit the culture. And so that happened a lot. You know, that happened. It, it, it frankly, half the time for 50 people, it didn't even get to the tools. They just weren't comfortable getting sat down a second time. And so it was, you know, like, hey, this, this, this job. Yeah, you know, I don't want the tools or this or that. You know, the behavior and the, and the, and the, the, the culture, their, their personal, their personal culture showed through and, uh, and and I was and I, that's what I was most surprised by. How do you fire somebody? Is it is it long and drawn out? Are you taking copious notes, putting them on constant notices? You know, and I realize Florida may be a little bit easier. Like California is terrible, right? You gotta you gotta document everything. So, you know, are you giving people a lot of chances? Or are they kind of figuring it out on their own and leaving on their own? Or or do you have to kick them out sometimes? Well, when the lights of accountability came on, <clears throat> um, you know, when we started having these conversations. Uh, they, 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 it became more voluntary, right? That's, that's, um, that's when, you know, it's a culture problem is, is when it becomes voluntary. So today, like I'm, I, today I probably can't sit down with a single person to fire before they already know they're getting fired. Like they know that if, that if we're sitting down, you know, for the second or the third time, they know what time it is. And so, and so it's, it's just a different thing. Like if you've done your job, as John says a lot, if you've done your job as a manager, the employee knows what direction the conversation is going. Right. Yeah. Very cool. All right, man. Well, this has been awesome. I, one of the last questions I like to ask people is, you know, imagine our, our listeners are they're on a plane, uh, on a treadmill, in a car. They can't take notes. Uh, but what would you want them to do? Uh, as soon as they get somewhere where they can take action. Uh, and either, maybe they're a corporate salesperson, maybe they're a technician, right? Maybe they're, they're dreaming about launching their own business or they've launched a business and they're struggling. Uh, what would you recommend they do the moment they can take action after listening to this podcast to make a difference in their, in their life, their business life, you know, all the above? 
you know, a couple things that have that have really um, kind of changed my life, and I recommend to a lot of entrepreneurs is if I was you know 17 or even 23, I wish somebody would have sat me down and told me to study uh, quantum theory or quantum physics to understand that you know everything becomes energy, and, and not to get too spiritual on you. But everything becomes energy, and there's a significant cause and effect that happens in the world. And so for every action you take, positive or negative, there's, there's going to be a reaction, and there's going to be an effect. And so in business, you just have to take – you're going to make lots and lots of mistakes. So you have to take lots and lots and lots and lots of actions. And you can't – you're never going to have the full plan. You know, again, like I started off the podcast, it used to be if it was 50% good, I took action. You know, now I've got a couple extra KPI in there to make decisions, but you're never going to have the answer. You're never going to be the perfect thing. If something's not working, it's very simple. It isn't right. Make a change. And guess what? Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. And if it doesn't work, you make another change. And the faster that you pull that trigger, the faster momentum you get moving and the faster you get going. Study quantum physics. You know, that's the first time. Uh, let me see here. You're going to be around the 205th episode, and this is the first time anyone's brought up quantum physics. So, you know, kudos for making that milestone. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So we're going to link to you uh, in the show notes, but uh, we'll send people to brunoair.com. Or do you have a new one? Is it just thinkbruno.com now? No, no, no. It's so brunoair.com. Okay. That's, That's our company thing. All right, we'll link to your Twitter as well. And if you're in the Naples area, give Lewis a call, right? Yeah, we're at, uh, I'm personally at Real Lewis Bruno everywhere on social media Twitter, um, Instagram, Facebook, uh, you know, YouTube, all, all that. And then uh, we're Bruno Air from a company standpoint. Okay. And, uh, and we're going to make sure you'd be surprised the mistakes people make because you said at. Uh, real Lewis Bruno everywhere, and people would start typing in real Lewis Bruno everywhere. But it's actually just real Lewis Bruno, and we will link to that as well. Look at that. I just pulled you out. Nice yellow truck. You got the red and blue circles going around. I bet that stands for heating and air conditioning, right? Yeah, man. Heat comes down, and it turns into cold air. <laughs> Very nice. All right. Lewis Bruno all the way from Naples, Florida. Thanks for coming on the sales podcast. Thanks, Wes. Thanks for having me, brother. Catch all right, man. Have a great day. You know, in the seven deadly sins of selling, I say that uh, one of those is assumption malfunction. But I love his assumption. They assume the referral. They're going in there assuming they're going to get a referral. So I love that assumption. You need to be implementing those types of processes as well, right? They have a leave behind. Um, and I love what he did with hiring non-technicians because he knew the blue collar guys would be tough to train. You know, you cannot win a football game. You cannot win the Super Bowl with a bunch of horse jockeys, right? And you're not going to win the Kentucky Derby with a 340 pound offensive lineman riding that horse. So you got to get the right people in the right positions and don't be afraid to go outside the norm. Even in sales, I encourage uh, people all the time to hire for chemistry, hire for motivation, hire for coachability rather than past performance. Because just like investing in the stock market, right, investing in mutual funds, past performance is no guarantee of future success. Just because someone has been a successful salesperson doesn't mean they will be. Rarely are the top salespeople looking for jobs, okay? They're happy where they are. They're being treated well. Sure, sometimes they get screwed over and they go looking, but people that are actively banging down your door are probably looking for a reason. So be careful looking for industry experience. Be careful looking for any sales experience. Have a great sales training system and bring on motivated individuals with good chemistry. That is one of the key takeaways from this. Uh, but again, like every episode, there's a ton of information in here, little nuances. Go back and listen to it again. Go check out the notes at thesaleswhisper.com forward slash session 204. Uh, you can get links to the books, links to Lewis as well. 
you know, follow him on, on social media, um, see what he's doing. You can learn a lot. I mean, this guy is 26, 27 years old, uh, doing over $10 million, right? Something like $18 million. I mean, just phenomenal growth in a very short amount of time. Uh, and he's only just begun, you know, so follow people getting things done instead of celebrities and goofballs. Uh, but you're listening to this podcast, so you probably don't follow celebrities and goofballs anyway. That's why you're more successful than your peers and those around you. If you would like to continue accelerating your growth, as I said at the top of the show, sign up for the daily tips and nuggets. You can get it on the right-hand side of any of the pages and posts, and this will give you a little insight into the Inbound Sellers Club. Uh, Growing inbound sales is the only way to really grow. Sure that you can hustle, right? The whole 10 X thing, blah, blah, blah. But that's just going to wear your butt out over time. It's not scalable. It's not reproducible. So when you can learn to create inbound sales, the sky is the limit. All right. So head on over there. The sales whisper.com forward slash session two zero four, get the notes, get the daily emails and remember to sell different.